Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Saturday studies. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis. We're going to be in chapter number six this afternoon. And there's a little bit of controversy there that we'll deal with right off the bat. So I'll give you my opinion and I'll tell you right now that my opinion and my belief and the way this uh, controversial passage is to be interpreted is in the minority of people today in the age in which we live. Although I believe that we can verify from the early church fathers' writings and the Dead Sea Scrolls that it was the prominent belief way back in the time of uh, Jesus' earthly ministry. But I'll begin reading at Genesis chapter 6, verse number 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Verse number two begins this huge controversy, at least in our day. I don't think it was a controversy, as I said earlier, in the days of the, sometimes people refer to those days as the second temple era. That would be the temple that was there during earth, the Jesus' earthly ministry. The first one had, Solomon had made had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And then the temple was rebuilt, although it was not quite as glorious as Solomon's temple. And this second temple was the one that was there when Jesus' earthly ministry took place. And so I believe that uh, the people had a similar belief to the way I interpret this and my opinion of it is back in those days, based upon the writings and the teachings of that time. But in our day, there has come to be two opposing views of this verse number two, where it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. The oldest view, and the one that I believe is the correct one, is that these sons of God refer to angelic beings, and in this case, fallen angels who rebelled against God and followed Lucifer or followed Satan and cohabited with the daughters of men that ended up in a hybrid race that were giants and the Bible refers to as Nephilim. But the more popular view in our day, and I'm fearful that the, the view that's taught by the majority of seminaries today is that the sons of God represent the righteous sons of Seth, so they say, and they then married daughters of men who represented daughters or descendants of Cain. I don't know exactly why that particular view has become so popular. Maybe because people don't think that it's possible for angels to cohabitate with women. Maybe because of what Jesus told the Sadducees when they asked that ridiculous question about the woman who had been married to seven brothers. And their question was in the resurrection, whose wife will she be since she was married to them all? And Jesus told them that they were in error, not knowing the scriptures, that in the resurrection, people are neither given in marriage or taken in marriage, but are like the angels. And so people take from that, that angels are not able to cohabitate with women and, and uh, have relations with them and produce offspring. And the Bible doesn't say that they can't do that, but it's almost as if people that believe that the sons of God are male descendants of Seth, who have married the daughters who descended from Cain, are trying to avoid the supernatural viewpoint of this particular uh, passage. But the sons of God in the Old Testament, the 
Hebrew word benai Elohim, I believe is representing a direct creation of God. In other words, the angels were directly created by God and they were referred to as sons of God. Adam also was a direct creation of God and he was referred to as a son of God. But you and I are descendants of Adam and Eve through Noah and his family. And we are made in the image of God, but we are not sons of God when we are born. We are descendants of Adam. But I'll read a verse in a minute from the Gospel of John chapter 1 that tells us when and how we can be considered children or sons of God. But first, I want to read from the book of Job three verses that speak about the sons of God representing angelic beings. The first reference is in Job chapter 1 and verse 6. Now there were now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also was among them. So here, these sons of God presented themselves before the Lord. I believe that it means the angels presented themselves before the Lord, and Satan, although he had already fallen, also did that. The next reference comes from Job chapter 2 and verse number 1. Remember that the story of Job was that Job was the greatest man of the East and was a righteous man and was a very wealthy man, but he worshiped the one true God. And Satan accused God that Job only worshiped him because God had blessed him. And so God allowed for Satan to take away all that he had. So he lost all of his earthly possessions, all of his 10 children. Only his wife was left and she gave such a terrible suggestion. She said that he should just curse God and die. And so Job continued to worship God. So then we come to chapter 2 and verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And that was the time when God said, Have you considered my servant Job? Even though you have taken everything away from him, he still is a righteous man and still worships me. And that's when Satan said, Well, you take away his health and he won't worship you. And so that's when God said that you can touch him, but you cannot kill him. And so that's when Job had that terrible, whatever his malady was, and had sores all over his body. And then his three supposedly friends came. And then after seven days of sitting with him in quietness, which was the only time probably they were a blessing to him, then they began to try to tell Job that he was suffering from that because of some hidden sin in his life. They didn't know the real story, just like Job didn't know the real story. So then during that course of the book of Job, Job mentioned several times that he wished that he could have an audience with God because he maintained that he had worshiped God and was righteous and so forth. And so eventually, when we get to chapter 38 of Job, he had that opportunity to visit with God. But instead of him asking questions of God, God asked him questions one right after the other, almost like a machine gun firing questions at Job. And I've tried to count those questions that God asked of Job, and I got above 65, I think it was. And he was asking Job those questions so fast and so furious that I'm sure that Job's head was just spinning. And in chapter number 38 and verse 7, one of the questions God asked Job was, Where were you when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? And so there again, I believe, is the sons of God referring to the angels shouting for joy when they were watching God's creation of the 
heavens and the earth. Well, I said that you and I, when we were born, are not technically children of God or sons of God. We are sons of Adam. But in John chapter 1, John the Apostle in his gospel in the first chapter says that there comes a time when we are born again, when we trust in Christ and we're born again spiritually into the family of God, then we are considered children or sons of God. Verse 12 of John chapter 1 says, But as many as received him, speaking of Christ, to them he, Christ, gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And then what the Apostle Paul had to say in a familiar verse to you, I'm sure, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So my opinion of this passage is that the correct interpretation is that the sons of God represent angelic beings. And in this particular context of this passage, represent fallen angels who cohabitated with women. And the result of that will be a hybrid race of giants or Nephilim, and it will be an attempt by Satan to defeat God's eternal redemptive plan for mankind. So I'll continue reading now that, uh, it, well, first of all, ever since the beginning in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, after the fall of man when Adam and Eve sinned, and God spoke to them, and he also spoke prophetically to them and to Satan in verse 15 of chapter 3, that one day out in the future, the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. And ever since then, I think Satan has attempted, up until the Messiah was born, to contaminate the DNA or the genome of mankind. Since Christ came as the Messiah, he could, it's too late for him to ruin the genome or the DNA of man to prevent the Messiah from coming. So then he tried to go about annihilating all the Jewish race because one of the promises was that Jesus would come back as king of the Jews and set up his kingdom that would never end. And so Satan has been in the business of trying to annihilate all the Jews down through history since then. So this passage at this time, as well as after the flood, Satan tried to corrupt man's DNA thereby corrupting humanity. And then the other ways he tried to stop God's plan was to kill all the descendants of David from which the line to the Messiah was to come. And he's also tried to annihilate the Jews altogether with people like Haman, if you remember the story in the book of Esther, and also Hitler in World War II. And we see the rise of anti-Semitism such as we haven't seen it in my lifetime at this current time. And I believe that is an indication that we're approaching the end of the age. So therefore, I think the primary reason for the flood of Noah was to destroy that hybrid race of Nephilim. And we'll notice that God would do that, and he could do that, through Noah to repopulate the earth because we'll read that Noah had a perfect generation. And we'll read that further. So now we come to verse 3 of chapter 6 of Genesis. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. I don't think that means that he'll live to be 120 because we have record of them living hundreds of years prior to the flood. I believe that it means that from that moment that he made this statement, 
there would be 120 years and then he would bring about the flood. Verse four says, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God, those fallen angels, came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, the Nephilim. Those were the mighty men. They will all have died in the flood, but we'll see that apparently it happened again after the flood because there were also giants that were in the promised land when the Israelites got there after they exodus from Egypt, who were also Nephilim. So, but that's beyond the scope of this current study of going through this, the first 12 chapters of Genesis. So that would be a study for another time. Verse number five, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent and thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them. Then verse eight says, <clears throat> but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So we're going to see in the next few verses how and maybe why Noah found grace in God's eyes. Verses nine through 12 of chapter six, the subheading, Noah pleases God. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. I believe that means that his family tree or line that, that he had been a descendant of had not been contaminated by that hybrid race or those fallen angels that cohabitated with, men, with women. So I believe that's the correct interpretation for this phrase, perfect in his generations. So Noah walked with God and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. So again, I believe that means that his DNA was not contaminated by those hybrids. So verse 13 through 22 the remainder of the chapter speaks about the preparation of the ark. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with the violence through them and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. Remember, a cubit goes from the tip of the elbow to the tip of the fingers. And in generality, we could say it's about 18 inches. So if we consider a cubit as a foot and a half, if this is 300 cubits, it would have been uh, 300 times a foot and a half would have been 450 feet long. It's width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above. So at the top of the ark around it, there's a window. And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under the heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives with you. So that will be eight people. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you, that they shall be male and female of the birds 
after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive, and you shall take for yourself of all the food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Remember that prior to the flood, every living creature's diet was vegetarian. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. So God's going to start over with Noah and his family and all the animals and the creeping things. Sometimes I wish that things like flies and gnats and mosquitoes wouldn't have been there. But for whatever reason, God saw fit for them to be there. That means that every person on earth, if they could trace their ancestry far enough, all would end back up at Noah and his three sons. So we're all related, regardless of our nationality or ethnic group or color of our skin. If we could all take our ancestry tree all the way back, it would be at the feet of one of those three sons of Noah either Shem, Ham, or Japheth. We also see <clears throat> that uh, God supports in this chapter one of those fundamental principles that we talked about way back in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And that is that God used two genders, male and female, of these people and animals and birds and creeping things and all of those things that entered the ark, male and female. So those fundamental biblical principles found in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, male and female genders, period. Next week, we'll look at the flood itself and life at the end of the flood in chapters seven and eight, if you'd like to read ahead. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. You have seen fit to preserve your history of the creation of the world and everything in it. And to also let us know that there came a time when you brought judgment upon the earth by the flood because of the sin and degradation that was over all the earth. And your plan and eternal redemptive plan for man was to repopulate the earth through Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives. And so as we prepare to follow the remaining chapters in chapters 7 through 11 and a portion of chapter 12, Help us to realize your redemptive plan for mankind and how that you will see it unto the end. How that we can take heart that your promises will never fail. Thank you so much for those who join us online. I pray that you would bless them with safety and good health. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hope you have a good Lord's Day tomorrow and enjoy fellowshipping with other believers. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Until then, Lord bless you.